So thank you, Katerina, and thank you for the opportunity to tell you about um, our research on infectious diseases. And today, I really want to talk about uh, climate change and, and specifically arboviruses. So what are arboviruses? So arboviruses cause climate sensitive diseases. And we are talking about viruses such as dengue, Zika, chikungunya. These are viruses that uh, spread and uh, circulate endemically within the human population. But we are also talking about zoonoses. It's viruses such as yellow fever and West Nile virus that circulate within the animal reservoir. And then occasionally they spill over into the animal, into the human population. So these viruses pose a high burden of infection and disease. They cause a high economic burden as well. Um, and they can cause severe disease. So for instance, dengue is a childhood disease in high transmission settings, for instance, in Southeast Asia. And dengue can cause dengue hemorrhagic fever, dengue shock syndrome that can lead to death. Uh, these viruses such as Zika, for instance, can actually cause harm to unborn children. So it has been shown that Zika infection of pregnant mothers can cause microcephaly. So babies cannot develop the brain as they should, and they are born with smaller than usual heads. That actually has very negative effect not just on the child, but also on the entire families. But these viruses such as chikungunya and West Nile also cause negative impacts in older populations. They cause um, chronic um, joint pain, as well as uh, kind of uh, negative um, neurological conditions in elderly population. And these diseases really have potential for causing surges in, in hospitalizations at the level of what we have experienced in London, for instance, during the pandemic, except these things happen in low and middle income countries year round. Um, just to give you a sense of the kind of rising number of cases of dengue, for instance, these have been increased over the years. And just from last year to this year, there has been a ninefold increase in the number of cases reported. And clearly, this, is, this isn't just driven by improved surveillance, improved reporting. There is something else ongoing. And, and new communities are affected across all transmission settings. In Brazil, for instance, 481 new communities where dengue hasn't been circulating ever have been detected, uh, have been detected new dengue infections over the last few years. In Nepal, where dengue was introduced in 2009, well, now we know that dengue is spreading into the mountain regions. And in Europe, I'm sure you have, heard that you have heard that over the summer, hundreds of cases have been locally acquired in Italy, France, and Spain. Uh, and what do these diseases have in common? Well, they are spread by mosquitoes. And this is why, and here you see a picture of Aedes albopictus and Aedes um, aegypti. These are the two main uh, mosquito species involved with these diseases. Well, this is why these diseases are climate sensitive. So effectively, the mosquito biology is driven by climate. So mosquitoes are ectotherms. It means that they cannot regulate their body temperature. And therefore, all the stages in mosquito development are affected by temperature. So from the moment that mosquitoes lay leg in water to the moment these eggs develop into larvae, pupae, and then from when the mosquito emerges and becomes an adult mosquito, well, all these stages are driven by the temperature of where these mosquitoes live in. And it has been shown that there is an optimal temperature for all these traits. So for instance, you know, the adult lifespan, as well as the biting rates and the rate at which, at which mosquitoes develop really are affected by climate. There is a temperature optimum, but also there is a specific range outside which these mosquitoes cannot live. And this is why these mosquitoes are geographically contained into specific regions so far. But also mosquitoes need water. Because, there is an old, uh, the, because of the aquatic stage of the mosquito life cycle. And despite this fact, and it's kind of established that mosquitoes need water, well, the relationship between rainfall and mosquito abundance, for instance, is much more theoretical and less well-defined. And for instance, we know that too much water can close flushing of larvae, so we expect the mosquito abundance to go down. But perhaps counterintuitively, we also expect that less water actually increases the abundance of these mosquitoes because of human behavior and water storage practices. And there is also some interesting relationship with humidity. So it has been argued that humidity is an overlooked variable uh, in the mosquito biology and humidity actually really modulates these thermal dependencies because humidity plays a role in evaporation and in the water tension and therefore affects the larval mosquito uh, stage uh, of, of the mosquito life cycle. 
So um, this is our understanding of, of the effect of climate. But what about climate change and arboviruses? And I'm sure you have seen many headlines really attributing the rises in the number of cases and the more um, severe epidemics caused by these viruses due to climate change and, and warming conditions. And as has been mentioned already, you know, in a few days at, in Dubai at COP28, we will have for the first time a health day where really there will be a discussion around the climate um, effects um, and the health impacts of climate change. So what is this evidence? So um, there is agreement around the fact that really arboviruses and these mosquitoes will expand their geographic range. So that means that mosquitoes will move north and south towards the poles. Um, over the short term, it is expected that both mosquito species will increase their risk to human populations, but over the long term, it will be the Aedes aegypti mosquito that will cause a higher risk, and this is due to their higher thermal tolerance. Overall, all of the estimates point towards an increase in the population at risk, and this is uh, established both uh, using different indicators like climate and environmental suitability, as well as transmission potential indicators. I would argue that it's not just a matter of number of people at risk. The population that will be at risk is populations that haven't seen the virus before. And so it's populations that will be completely susceptible. There is no immunity to the viruses that can lead to explosive outbreaks and, and epidemics in these populations. There is evidence that there will be longer transmission seasons and more places around the globe will have year-round transmission where actually now there is a well-defined seasonality in, in the patterns of transmission. And a couple of studies have actually started estimating the increase in the number of cases. And, and for instance, it has been estimated that committing to reducing warming to below 2 degrees can actually save 2.8 million cases a year in Latin America. And interestingly, similar exercise has been done recently for Southeast Asia. That's a panel that you see at the bottom. And interestingly, one of the key outcomes of this um, exercise has been that indirect effects of climate are important. So it's not just the effect of climate, but also its effect of increases in the population sizes and economic differences, like in terms of GDP, that really determines the impact and how committing to kind of reductions in the warming can really have a positive impact on reducing the number of cases. Going a bit beyond arboviruses, well, there is clear evidence that climate change can lead to increasing the spillover of unknown viruses. So it's, it's understood, and our understanding at the moment is that with warming temperature, species will change their distributions. So new species will aggregate at higher elevation, there will be kind of hotspots of um, you know, encounters between these species that can cause crossovers and cross infection. Eventually, that means we will probably face more pandemics and more frequent pandemics going forward. And how were these estimates um, generated? So there are two broad um, categories of methods that have been used so far to generate these estimates. One is based on the projection of thermal performance curves. So these thermal performance curves can be summarized in terms of uh, transmission intensity and simply the climate change projections in terms of warming, for instance, have been used to project forward uh, what um, you know, the transmission intensity of these viruses will be and therefore how many more people will be exposed to these viruses. But also there is a second class of methods that link the number of cases that have been observed in the past with some covariates, for instance, population, climate, GDP, and mobility. And by calibrating the models on the past, then the strength of the association is then used to project forward what the number of cases is, is predicted and is going to be by projecting forward the impact of climate on, for instance, population, GDP, and mobility. And, and these methods have some strengths. I mean, clearly, you know, they try to combine changes in the RCP and SSP projections uh, in terms of, for instance, projecting forward the climate and the, economic in, the economy in terms of GDP. Demography, demography is, is taken into account so far in terms of number of people and kind of number of people living on the planet, as well as some migration patterns. But these methods also have some limitations. So none of the methods that are used so far 
really account for age and for the fact that some of these projections, uh, socioeconomic projections, estimate that in some instances populations will become older, which is a key factor for you know, infectious diseases. None of these methods account for immunity. And arboviruses are diseases that cause, um, that actually um, immunize you. So you can be infected a specific number of times. So for dengue, it's four, but for the other viruses, it's typically once. And immunity is a key driver of the dynamics of this transmission that cannot be overlooked. So these methods do not really account for changes in surveillance, but most importantly, there is no account for the impact of interventions in these projections. And, and actually, it's quite of an exciting time uh, for arbovirus control. It's exciting and specifically for dengue. Um, so there are new vector control strategies that are um, highly successful. They are effective and they are self-sustainable. Bulbakia, for instance, there has been a, a randomized control trial uh, in Indonesia that has shown that the use of Bulbakia can really reduce dengue incidence by 77%. There are new vaccines, so the Takeda vaccine has just completed phase three trial. It has been licensed in a number of locations. And there is a new promising uh, vaccine developed by the NIH and Butantan Institute uh, that really shows some promise and is currently in phase three trial. There is also antiviral, so um, we have worked with um, JNJ looking at the impact of new candidates from in vitro and in vivo studies. And these antivirals really show high efficacy at really reducing the viral load uh, of infected patients. There are also some challenges. So Vulbachia, for instance, has been um, estimated and it has been shown that Vulbachia actually drops out where the climate and where the weather is too hot. Um, these vaccines have a very high uh, and complex, have a complex uh, efficacy profile which makes this intervention suitable in some places, but not in others. And antivirals, despite they are highly eff efficacious and, and, and they appear to show some promise, well, there is a very limited time at which antivirals can be used for treatment, just for the nature, the acute nature of the infection, because the viral load decreases very quickly. Um, so it is in this context, you know, looking at the impact of climate change as well as intervention on the dynamics of diseases, that there is a research program ongoing in the department. Um, this is work that has largely been funded by, by Wellcome. And our objective really is to develop new, metal, new, me new methods to uh, account for climate drivers in transmission disease models. This is models we do, where, where we do not just look at the impact of association, but where we try and capture the infection process between humans and mosquitoes. And, and, and our vision is to really calibrate these models to time series data and transmission intensity maps to really generate uh, impact of climate change, both on the transmission dynamics, but also taking into account of intervention in a way. So to kind of estimate what the offset of climate change is on the uh, on the impact of our new interventions uh, that, that, that are coming up. And we're also developing tools to allow policymakers as well as kind of non-modelers to really estimate and try to use and, 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 and estimate by themselves what the impact of both climate change and interventions have um, on, on these viruses and these diseases. Um, there are some challenges and there are some uncertainties. So for, in, for instance, we still really need to pin down what the biological effect of changes in temperature and rainfall uh, have, you know, um, on, on these diseases. And there is really a big knowledge gap on the impact of extreme weather events on transmission dynamics. I mean, and this is very much linked to what Ralph was saying this morning. There has been limited opportunities, if you want, to observe these rare events. So we are really unsure about what the impact will be but we will be trying to fill these knowledge gaps. Um, we know that the thermal relationships that have been obtained from experiments conducted in the lab with mosquitoes that have lived in the lab for decades may not be fully representative of what happens in the field. And, and there is an argument for there being some dependencies by species. Um, so I think it will be important to look into this and to look into you know, how reliable the estimates that we are currently using are. Also, big question is how you know these mosquito populations will evolve and will adapt to climate. In terms of human populations, we have limitations in terms of um, kind of disease surveillance, 
And there are some gaps, especially in Africa, but that also in other countries, around how much we know and, and how diseases are really monitored. We also don't know much about, or not enough, about immunity and cross-immunity, cross-reactivity of these viruses that are related. Um, and also a big question is how, you know, the mosquito and the virus will interact going forward under climate and other heat stress. But when there are challenges, there are opportunities. And I would argue that these questions and other, you know, important questions really can be addressed by co-designing and co-developing studies not just uh, working in isolation, but very much with interdisciplinary research between and, you know, epidemiologists and modelers with climate scientists, entomologists, people who develop these interventions like diagnostic vaccines and therapeutics, as well as policymakers. And I hope that there will be some opportunity maybe to discuss this this afternoon in the breakout sessions. So in conclusion, uh, what are the priorities? Well, we think and we are committed to ge really generate quantitative estimates of benefits of climate mitigation on health. It's important to generate infection and burden estimates that as much as possible take into account of the indirect effects of climate change, just beyond the climate change itself. So for instance, we need to account for demographic shifts, population displacement, urbanization. Of course, we need to account for the impact of interventions, but as often happens, Policy happens when there is a cost associated to things. And so we need to quantify costs. We need to quantify costs averted, costs incurred, and so on. I would argue we need to look at disease dynamics because these viruses uh, can cause huge stress on health systems that cannot be overlooked. And this has negative impacts on all other diseases. So we, ju we just don't need... To and we don't want to have just a static vision of what the impact will be. We need to look at the dynamics of these diseases in these populations. And to have an impact, we know we need to collaborate with the communities that are most affected. And we, we do this and we want to continue to do this. We need to speak to local governments, global organizations and stakeholders. And at the end of the day, it's a matter of finding ways to communicate effectively these findings. Um, to the scientific community, general public, but especially to policymakers, ultimately to really try and inform and, and, and uh, help uh, the generation of um, kind of fair and equitable policies for the interest of global health. Thank you.